Welcome anybody, everybody to the latest uh, Turing seminar on multi-agent systems. My name is Mike Waldridge. I'll be uh, uh, chairing this session uh, this morning. Firstly, just a reminder, things are being recorded. Um, so just bear that in mind. Um, I'm delighted to be able to welcome today's speaker, uh, Alessio Lumusio, uh, who's a professor at Imperial College London, who's going to be talking about the verification of neurosymbolic multi-agent systems. I've known for Alessio for about a quarter of a century. Uh, he is, I think, probably the most prominent figure in the automated verification of multi-agent systems uh, and uh, uh, was the leading light behind the development of the MCMAS uh, model checking system, which is now very widely used in our community. Uh, he is uh, the Professor of Safe Artificial Intelligence at Imperial College, and he leads the Verification of Autonomous Systems Lab. And also he serves as Deputy Director for the UKRI Doctoral Centre in Safe and Trusted Artificial Intelligence. He's a distinguished ACM member and a Fellow of the European Association for AI, and he currently holds an extremely prestigious Royal Academy of Engineering Chair in Emerging Technologies. Historically, I think it's fair to say that Alessio's research interests were in the symbolic side of AI, but as so many of us uh, have discovered uh, the need to reinvent ourselves uh, in the era of the new AI, uh, he's uh, turned his attention to uh, the very substantial problem of verification of uh, neural systems. So Alessio, it's wonderful to welcome you today uh, and over to you. Thank you very much, Mike. and. Uh... Can you see the screen? Yep, and, uh, got it. Can you hear me perfectly? Okay, very good. Thanks very much, Mike, for your very nice in introduction. And it, it's great to be here. It's great to be able to share some of our thinking with you. I'm sorry we're not doing this in person. I hope we'll be able to meet in person soon. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to uh, say straight away, this is joint work with many, many members of the Verification Autonomous Systems Group uh, over the years. I've singled out here Michael Akitunde, Elena Boteva, Panayotis Kovaros, Francesco Lefante, Patrick, Herrick, Patrick Herrickson, and Eduardo Pirovano. But really, it, 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 many of the ideas and many of the technical details behind this uh, have been um, uh, produced over the years in the group. This is also work that's been funded by DARPA, the US, US agency, and uh, UKRI, and the Royal Academy of Engineering. It's meant to be really a personal perspective on how we've evolved to the point where we are. And, and so I think it's, it's really more describing the journey that we've done so far more than giving the technical details. I'll, I'll leave you with some pointers on the technical details and there's plenty of material for the technical details, but it's more the, the high level perspective here. So I'd like to begin really with, with the era of verification of autonomous systems and multi-agent systems like Mike has described. and. Uh, and then uh, touch upon uh, verification agent swarms and how we got to the point where we need to consider, I think, a new paradigm of neural symbolic multi-agent systems. Now, to explain that, I will be talking a little bit about the verifying the perception layer of an agent, and then I will be closing on with some remarks on verifying closed loop uh, neural symbolic multi-agent systems. That's pretty much the plan for the talk. Uh, feel free to interrupt me to, uh, to, you know, for any questions, otherwise I'll take them at the end. Uh, now, you know, the starting point is, is what everybody here is, will be very familiar with. It's uh, multiple agents interacting with an environment. And uh, it, it's, uh, I want you to put down that it's, it's from the 90s, not to say that it's a, no, it's a kind of last millennium idea, but just to say how powerful uh, this paradigm has been and how far it's taken us. Uh, and that is, that is a sign of the really good ideas that last for such a long time. So we have an environment that, you know, an agent that's observing the environment through a perception layer. It's doing some reasoning <clears throat> in various ways, selecting what age, what action to perform onto the environment, possibly joined with some other agents and, uh, and, you know, overall to meet it's really its own design objectives. That's really the paradigm uh, that we know and we're fond of in a multi-agent systems era. Now, what people started thinking about, you know, um, a good 20 years ago was how do we actually specify the resulting behaviors here? And the key idea that emerged right at the beginning was that we should uh, probably move away from plain temporal logic and use more sophisticated AI notions to be able to reason about uh, specifications and behaviors. So uh, right from the beginning, people investigated ideas of reasoning about the knowledge, reasoning about goals, 
reason about faults, recovery, intentions, beliefs, desires, and so on. So we ended up with formalisms, four specifications that were uh, more expressive than plain temporal logic. And I think it's fair to say that the multi-agent systems community has made a big contribution to uh, specifications of reasoning about interactions through, um, through expressive specifications. Um, so, um, you know, we, we worked on private and common knowledge specifications. A lot of the community worked on strategic ability uh, to enforce a particular states of affairs. Of course, the BDI paradigm has always been very uh, prominent here, and also rules, regulations that agents uh, will um, uh, independently and collectively need to obey. Uh, so that really body of work led to a natural intuitive specifications pertaining to states of information and capabilities of the agents. So there was a need at the time to provide verification methods that would actually support expressive specifications, such as the ones that we have on this slide. Okay, so what would this specification talk about? Well, it would talk about effectiveness in communication. So in the first specification, we have something like, once an act has been received, the sender knows that the receiver knows the value of the bit. But there will be a lot much more powerful than this. We could be talking about diagnosability, knowing about the presence of faults. We could be talking about joint recover recoverability with um, logic such as ATL. We could be talking about uh, properties of swans, such as the knowledge, uh, or common knowledge even, of their state of being connected in the swarm. And then there'll be you know, very sophisticated work in talking about equilibrium and rational play among the agents. And so there was a need, as I was saying, to be able to capture uh, these specifications and try to verify um, <clears throat> specifications in, in this context. It is really where the MCMAS project started a, a long ago and carried up, up until recently, where we have a model checker framework when which we um, input a system, input some specifications which can be very expressive, and, um, and we, we try and establish whether or not the specifications hold, and if not, try to get a counterexample to try and understand what, uh, you know, how things are going wrong in a particular, in a particular, in a particular example. Um, now, the problem at the time, and I want to uh, pause on this for a second because we will come back to this, is that verification has always been facing the state explosion problem. And it was true at the time, and it is true today. So the work at, at that time and um, concern with trying to conquer larger and larger state spaces, resulting from more, more and more complex systems. So all the technical development, or a lot of the technical development that happened in the early 2000s really had to do with conquering what was called the state explosion problem. So we had approaches such as bounding model checking, uh, enabling us to take a verification of systems 10 to the 20. We had approaches that we developed on parallel model checking, and then increasingly sophisticated forms of abstractions, including symmetry reduction, predicate abstractions, and so on. So by conquering larger and larger state spaces, we were able to unlock more and more complex applications. So we worked on web services, including data-driven services, securities, and so on. Uh, at the same time, progress was being made on the specifications that we could tackle. So we came to the point where actually we could analyze um, um, uh, systems such as an autonomous submarine with our colleagues in Southampton, where we were able to um, verify several missions of a submarine before deployment. And the key issues that we began to focus on was not just the missions themselves, whether they would result in failure or in success, but actually how to reason about the correctness and the, and the full tolerance of a complex system such as this uh, in the context of verification. So in this project, what we did is that we, uh, we started actually from engineering design <clears throat> and uh, discretized it uh, into, into the language of the model checker, which is ISPL. So we uh, actually abstracted from Simulink state flow descriptions into, into ISPL. Now, to do this, what you know, a key consideration at the time from our colleagues in Southampton was really to analyze the consequences of faults. So what does that mean? Well, it means that you have a program which is executing correctly and you want to analyze that. That is the standard paradigm. 
But what you also want to do is that you want to introduce faults and analyze the consequences of faults. So to do this, we introduce a fault injector into the program that for which the engineer will be able to in introduce faults during the analysis in a variety of ways and understand the behavior that will result for that particular fault. This will enable us to talk about diagnosability of the particular faults when they happen, recoverability uh, from particular faults and, and beyond. So effectively you start from a system where you have a, uh, you would have, a, um, uh, you would have, you know, the nominal system, you'd be injecting faults and you'd be analyzing the consequences of faults. So really we, you know, you, you end up with a fairly sophisticated methodology where you start from the design, uh, which is based on simulating state flow, you process it and make it become an engineering model really and then you go through a, a, a list of analysis that involves injecting the faults into the system corresponding to some failure modes that you you may get from the engineer and analyze the behavior of these faults some of these faults you would uh, we actually um, um, found to be not particularly severe in the sense that they would not cause a loss of the submarine other faults um, actually, we discovered would be particularly severe, would cause a, fall, a, a, a total loss of the submarine. So being able to know which components are particularly important for the, uh, for, for the, for the health of the unit is, is, is particularly important for engineers to be able to um, put particular emphasis in some uh, components or others. Now, the reason I, I started from this point is, is, is that at this point, we were reasonably satisfied with the kind of complexity we were able to do, starting from verification of multi-agent systems, being able to analyze the submarine in this way, with a fairly sophisticated way, we really felt we were making considerable problem, uh, considerable progress in, in solving the problem. Not only this, but actually at the same time, uh, there was considerable amount of work in trying to extend this to, to swarm systems. So think about not just one submarine, but think about a system where you have multiple submarines uh, communicating with one another. Okay, so really the key issue here is whether you can guarantee the properties of the systems irrespective of the number of agents that you have in the systems. Okay, that, that is a hard problem. It's, it's a problem that's called uh, parameterized verification. And so with parameterized verification, we're able to develop methods that would enable us to solve problems such as this, where you can actually guarantee the behavior of a particular collective number of agents, irrespective of how many that are actually participating at runtime. Okay, um, so you no longer have two free agents, but you're actually proving the property for the protocol uh, of arbitrary many agents are happening at a runtime. And not only this, but actually you can then still analyze issues of faults and recovery, either because some of these units may be malicious or because they may break at runtime. That's very often the case with swarms. So we, you know, we develop techniques to be able to analyze what is the rate of failure that a particular swarm can actually tolerate while at the same time maintaining some high level property that they want. Uh, that we want from that particular protocol. This was also extended in the sense of stochastic behaviors. And I, I saw that uh, you know, Dave Parker was here, so um, um, I'm glad I have this slide here. And so we know that swarms are often stochastic and the agents behave uh, probabilistically in this sense. And it, in, it, it's still possible to reason about emergent behavior, even with stochastic protocols and parameterized verification can can be uh, can be analyzed in this in this context there was a, a successful uh, investigation led by eduardo pirovano on on this topic um leading to the production of guarantees for uh, um uh, for these sort of behaviors so at that time you know at, at, at this line uh, you know as i was saying there was a feeling that considerable progress was being made and um and, and of course, there was, however, one key assumption that was being made in all this work uh, by us and by many others. The key assumption is that in the mind of the agent, so to speak, we have a program effectively. So we have some code that's been skillfully engineered by a team of people, uh, which is actually running the, uh, the whole machinery. 
Uh, but as Mike was saying, we, we've seen a really a paradigm shift here. Uh, we've seen increasingly that actually we don't have code or we don't have only code, but we also have increasingly neural networks inside, inside these agents. So what are the implications of this? Um, well, we know the implications may be severe. We've already seen a lot of failures um, in the news and, and uh, in, the, in the literature, in fact, of um, particular neural systems, but in, in specifically in, uh, in while they're performing a runtime. Um, so what are the challenges that we face uh, if we are to try and reason about the behavior of a system that includes neural network? Well, we know that you know neural networks tend to be good on in distribution data, but maybe um, may perform poorly on out of distribution data. Key point is actually that they're actually fragile, very very fragile, even on distribution data, and sometimes they offer uh, strong confidence even while they're making mistakes. So this leads us to a situation where we have systems that are very hard to certify. And uh, this actually stops the deployment of this system and stops the deployment from the lab actually to, to the real system. So I think increasingly we're seeing systems that are no longer symbolic, uh, like the systems like the AutoSub that we were discussing before, but have several layers. Typically we have systems in which perception is realized through a neural network and then decision-making or planning or uh, intention selection is done on the symbolic, in a symbolic way. Uh, we also have controllers, pure controllers from control theory that are actually driving the action selection. So this is a picture I'd like to come to right at the end of the talk. Uh, but the way I would approach this is really to analyze the perception layer a little bit, say something about a neural controller and try to bring them together uh, towards the end of this talk. So what we've been working on for the past few years is very fine open loop perception systems. So these are neural networks uh, through a, a number of techniques. Um, I will highlight some, uh, not all, um, particularly milk-based verification approaches and abstraction approaches. And I will only focus on symbolic integral propagation here. We also work on other, other kind of more um, other topics still in the space of abstraction. And we'll be working on closed loop systems. So these are systems in which, you know, like, like the original picture uh, of the agent there, we have agents interacting with the environment. Um, and so this is what I will be mentioning in the rest of the talk and, and sharing some of, the, uh, some of the ideas behind this work. Right, so why do we have a problem with neural networks? I think you probably have seen this picture many, many times before. Neural networks are susceptible to what are called adversarial attacks. So what that means is that slight perturbations of an image, which we may not actually be able to see, may cause a misclassification of the image. Okay, so you see the, the uh, pig on the right hand side is classified as an airplane, but to us it looks exactly the same as the pig on the left hand side. Now we want to be able to establish whether it is the case or not that a particular neural classifier is susceptible to adversarial attacks. Okay. That is the problem we're trying to solve here. So formally, we have a set of inputs and a set of outputs. We want to be able to determine whether the output of this neural classifier is behaving as we would expect in the, in the neighborhood or in the region that we want to analyze. Typically, if you want to analyze susceptibility to noise, you're analyzing a region in the, in the infinite ball of a particular input that you're giving. And what you're analyzing is whether or not a neighborhood of that image <clears throat> may generate a different classification. Okay, that, that was the problem on the previous slide. However, in principle, what we be able want to do is not just analyze this kind of noise robustness, but also more complex uh, notions such as geometric transformations or color changes or luminosity changes or contrast changes and so on. So, you know, if, um, if, I, if I can detect a car on the road, I still like to detect that car if it's a little bit further away, if it's slightly rotated, if it changes color, if it's slightly brighter there, if it's slightly darker there and so on. Not only this, but I may actually have semantical changes as well. You know, this car could be slightly occluded, it could be changing in the pose, 
uh, it could slightly change the way it's presented to the detector. Much of the work so far has focused on noise, but a lot of um, a lot of progress has been made on all of this, including color luminosity contrast, rescaling, and so on. I will be focusing on noise just to, to keep this concrete, but please come back to me on, on any of these other uh, topics if you'd like to know more. Okay, so let's dig a little bit deeper into, into neural networks, and uh, we know that we're typically dealing with deep neural networks, typically they're feed forward, meaning there's no loops, and typically the activation function is a ReLU function. So ReLU function is this function here, y max zero, the sum of the inputs, or some weighted sum of the inputs, and you see that it's actually a, <clears throat> a function that is zero until, until the origin, and then it's a linear function. So the difficulties here is that we have activation functions which are, are difficult to handle and, uh, and, uh, and we, we need to be able to, to, to study reachability, to study the output, we need to be able to map this into a computationally feasible problem that we want to solve. So we started working with this with an undergraduate student whose name is Lalit Maganti, who's now with Google. Uh, he was an undergraduate student in Imperial. We started thinking about this together. And um, what was established was that actually there is a one-to-one -one correspondence that you can draw between the ReLU function and the mixed integer linear program. So if I write the ReLU function like I'm doing right at the top for one particular layer, like I'm doing there in a kind of vector notation, I can identify an active phase and an inactive phase which corresponds to these delta variables, which are binary, either being set to one or being set to zero. Okay? So in other words, if I take these constraints that I have right here at the bottom, the only solutions that I have for these constraints with, with, when delta is either zero or one, correspond exactly to the ReLU function that I'm modeling. Okay? And th this is important because it enables us to actually to recast the ReLU computational function through an optimization problem, through a mixed integer linear program. Okay? If you're thinking about doing this and combining all of this for all the layers, <clears throat> you can create a constraint problem, which is the union of all these problems and the pair it with an objecting function equal to zero. It can actually show a theorem that says the resulting problem that you constructed is feasible <clears throat> if and only if uh, Actually, if you feed it with the input that you have, it produces exactly the output of that neural network. In other words, we've recast the computation of a neural network, a feed-forward rail on neural network, uh, as, a, as a MILP instance. So this enables us to recast robustness verification. So that means the lack of the existence of adversarial attacks as a MILP problem. Now, at the time, there wasn't a result like this, right? So at the time, you actually had to run your neural network to try and, and, and establish such as something such as this. So that sounded really good at the time. However, solving MILP is MP hard. So it, it was not really a solution, you know, to be able to, to go around and verify object detectors uh, on the spot. So at the time, we could verify a few hundred nodes. And so, like in, in the days of model checking, the challenge was how do we start from a few hundred nodes and move maybe to a million nodes, which is what we need uh, to be at. So the issue was against scalability. That's a problem that doesn't go away in computer science, I'm afraid. Um, so I'm just going to share you some of the results that we produced in the past two, three years on conquering scalability. And one line of work has been led by Panayotis Kovaros, who's a postdoc at, at Imperial College, and it, um, it involves the idea of dep dependency-based verification. So when you solve a MILP, you're typically relying on the branch and bound procedure, which has been very, very effective in Groby and many other solvers. And the way it works is that you relax, so you have a mixed integer linear program, so you relax the integrality constraints into linear constraints, you solve the resulting linear program, and then you check if all the integrality constraints are satisfied, you're, you're done, you, have, uh, you can terminate. Otherwise, you branch on those integral variables and repeat for each of the resulting sum problems. Now, the blow up, uh, you, the NP hardness results on the possible number of, uh, of branching that you, you need to do for, for all these constraints that you need to branch upon. 
Now, the key insight here is that actually you can establish some dependencies. So actually you don't need to check all this uh, very large tree in all the possible decisions that you have for these branches. So there are some dependencies that can be analyzed and these dependencies talk about the status of a neuron as to whether it's active or whether it's inactive. Okay, so by analyzing dependencies between regions, effectively you can you can prune considerably the state space that you need to analyze uh, to be able to come up with a solution. So you can eliminate in whole regions of the state space while you're actually searching for this solution. <clears throat> so you would compute the dependencies and you would actually express these dependencies as constraints that you'll be adding to your solver at runtime. And this would actually help the solver to um, actually, by limiting the search space, you'd be helping the solver to, to solve the original query. Right? This is the key idea and the key, uh, and the key method. And it's also used, um, dependency is also used to formulate computationally easier MILP solutions. And this again, help the solver to be able to solve the verification query. So in, in this context, we identify the node that has the most dependent nodes. And so we approach the, the verification problem uh, by selecting the ones that are most promising for the verification. Okay. Uh, you can find more details on this uh, on the paper. Now, this is all implemented and actually can be downloaded from our web pages um, if you'd like to play with this. Effectively, you see that this combines, it's, it's in, in a toolkit called Venus, which combines a dependency analyzer uh, together with the MILP solver that actually solve the various verification queries for particular queries that you may want to put to that, either noise robustness or geometric robustness, contrast, luminosity, and so on. Um, now, in verification neural networks, there's annual competitions that, you know, all the uh, many, many teams around the world uh, um, uh, participate and, uh, and, and uh, we are going into uh, a lot of details. Venus does pretty well in those competitions. Okay, let me move on to, uh, to another approach, which is based on abstraction. And uh, just sharing some ideas on this, and then we're gonna move on onto uh, multi-agent systems properly. So in this work, what we do is that actually rather than solving the exact problem like you would do in MILP, we're actually looking at our abstraction. So rather than uh, computing the exact solution, we compute an approximate solution. But as long as the approximate solution is within the bounds that we're trying to show, we are actually guaranteed that approximate, that actually the original network satisfies those, uh, those um, uh, um, the original specification. So the reason I bring this up is that it's, it's very, you know, the general approach is very similar to something that we're very much used to in verification, which is abstraction refinement. Okay. And it's very similar here. We are abstracting the neural network into a relaxation. This relaxation just happens to be uh, done with symbolic interval propagation. We verify the abstraction. And if it's not, if we cannot verify the abstraction, we refine this abstraction. And how do we refine it is by splitting the, um, the abstraction that we are making for the neurons, which is done through a relaxation. Okay? The difference here is that the way that abstraction works is by a symbolic interval propagation. Now, symbolic interval propagation works by actually analyzing the equations for the lower bound and the upper bound in each neuron and propagating these equations and refine them, uh, refining them as they go along for the particular relaxation you're working on. Varinet can also be uh, downloaded on our web pages. And again, it, it's a toolkit that performs really, really well in uh, various uh, competition. The work on Varinet is led by a PhD student in our group called Patrick Harrickson. And Varinet um, came second in DNN 21 which is the most recent competition that took place uh, against a number of different cases. Okay, you can, you can look up the results on this. Okay, so I think I have about 20 minutes left, no more than that. So I would like to very briefly tell you that this work has been uh, applied in the context of uh, the airspace domain with our colleagues at Boeing in the US 
uh, to analyze the robustness of um, uh, perception systems while taxing on the runaway. And uh, we were able to assess the robustness of these systems, find counterexamples. And what you see here, for example, is an original image where we are correct, where the detector is correctly detecting uh, no track error from the runaway, from the center line. And the counterexample in which there is some noise being applied to the image where the um, the uh, detector is actually signaling a, a, a very considerable track error of 1.6 meters from the center line. Now, the one that you see on the right on the right is a is a uh, symbolically generated by the solver uh, counterexample. So it is the result of checking the verification query as to whether in the neighborhood you have no errors. The solver will come back to you and say, no, you actually have errors with this pattern of noise. This is the counterexample you will get. This is purely a counterexample on noise, but you can do the same against contrast, luminosity, uh, some geometric variations. You can do a lot by, by looking for counterexamples. And uh, Venus is complete. So in principle, all the counterexamples can actually be found. Okay, I, um, I will also say that if you uh, would like to take a look at that paper that I had before, you will find either other um, use cases where we apply this technology to including um, uh, what's called open category detection, where you're picking up novel objects after you haven't seen some already in your data set. I'm just going to, in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip uh, this use case. Now, the upshot of this is that right now we move from a few hundred nodes that we had in 2017 to a situation where we can verify hundreds of thousands of nodes and in some cases millions of nodes uh, depending on the perturbation that you're checking so effectively we we can actually verify cases of interest of, of um, actually uh, classifiers that actually i used in real life and we have support not only for noise but luminosity contrast relumination and a number of other things Okay, I would like to stop talking about perception, although you know I could be talking a lot more. I actually go back to the case where we actually have an agent which is interacting with the environment. So we're not only outputting the decision and what we're seeing and what we're perceiving, but actually acting on the environment. And uh, it turns out that actually this stack can actually be used in this, in this context. And so the first work that we did in this space was actually looking at uh, feed forward neural therefore memory less decision maker uh, which is purely taking the observations <clears throat> purely taking the input from the environment and returning actions okay so this is what a controller would actually do um so in this context we you know you have a formalization which is similar to the paradigm of interpreted systems and so on so we, you have an environment with a state space and a transition function you have an agent which is now a neural agent so you purely have a, a neural network which is implementing this function, selecting what action to perform given the state space. And so the question becomes, what verification queries can you actually formulate in a context such as this? Well, there are some queries that are actually quite interesting uh, to, to analyze. The first one is state reachability, so the, generally the reachability problem. Now, the single step says, well, given a region that you're interested, is there a, a state from which actually the agent would get into that region, okay? Or maybe you want to avoid getting into that region, either with one step or with several steps, okay? As a multi-step state reachability. You may also want to be interested in terms of whether there are actions that are performed in a given situation or not, okay? So for example, in a pendulum, you may not want some particular actions to be performed if you're trying to keep the pendulum upright. You may be able to identify some bugs in this way. So can we solve these queries uh, in, in a setting such as this? Um, so the good news is that, yes, they can be solved. It turns out that each of these decision problems can be fully characterized as a linear problem, as a mixed integer linear problem. And, and, and therefore, it can be solved by an appropriate solver through MILP compilation. Okay? Again, the resulting uh, issue here is that you still uh, with empty complete problems. So potentially you will be struggling to solve very, very large problems. 
again, this is this is uh, this is work that's been implemented and been been tested on OpenAI Gym programs, and you can download it again from our webpage. Um, now, memoryless agents are interesting, but uh, typically we want agents to have some memory, and and so the issue of memory and neural networks, of course, is 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 a little bit uh, tricky. Uh, probably the easiest memory full. Uh, neural network is a, re a recurrent neural network, and then there's more complex versions such as uh, LSTMs and so on. Uh, in this work, we try to see whether uh, recurrent can also be in principle verified. And again, the upshot of this is that yes, they can if you're prepared to unroll the, uh, the recurrent neural network, you can then verify bounded properties for that. Okay, so the setup here is slightly more complicated we have a, an environment with um, an observation space. And so you are observing the environment. And here the agent is memory full. So it's returning actions depending on the sequence of the observations this is actually making. <clears throat> so the specifications now then become temporal, right? Because having a, um, <clears throat> having a notion of memory, you can actually start identifying traces. Well, before we can only talk about reachability, here we can actually talk about successor states and so on. So we can talk about an until, we can talk about the next. And typically, we want to talk reason in terms of finite traces here, because otherwise the problem would not be solvable. Um, differently from what many of us are used to in a propositional setting, here the atoms are not propositional atoms. Here the atoms are equalities on disequalities on real numbers. So actually the state space is infinite here, even for the atoms. Okay. And then on top, you have your modalities that are defining conditions such as this. So given a system, the verification problem is the same given a specification, which could be a bounded, uh, um, linear uh, temporal logic. Can we, uh, can we, can we determine whether or not the system satisfies the specification? Now, the approach that we're taking in this line is to do the unrolling of a recurrent neural network and actually feed the recurrent neural network with the input as it is presented when it gets consumed. So we have a number of ways of feeding the input to a, to a recurrent neural network and transforming it into a feed forward neural network so that actually we can compose and, uh, and result and solve it via, um, via the existing tools that we have. So it turns out that if you're checking a particular trace of length K, you can construct an equivalent system <clears throat> which behaves exactly in the same way, either through input on demand or, or input on start of that particular neural network and verify the corresponding problem. On the, on, and, 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 and the nice thing about this is that actually the resulting system is a larger but feed forward neural network. Okay, so the problem is still MP complete and it can be solved in, in, in a large number of cases. Okay, so we are uh, kind of running out of time. So let me, let me discuss a couple of further steps. One involves non-deterministic environments. And so uh, in non-deterministic environments, we may not have linear executions, so we may have branching executions. <clears throat> so we may be interested to check whether or not a particular system will not go out of a safety region within a particular number of steps. And again, here we're bounding the length of the trace to be able to do that. And uh, so we have branching modalities and, uh, and some modalities that talk about how many steps we're actually checking. <clears throat> again, the, our basic atoms will be things that we can say about that particular system that typically on the real numbers. Okay. Again, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between solving the verification problem for systems such as this and, and MILP. And so uh, there is a correspondence in, in between the fact that if the resulting system has no solutions, uh, then actually the, um, the problem is uh, satisfiable. Uh, so this is likely counterintuitive, but actually what you're looking for is actually a counterexample. So if you cannot find a counterexample, effectively, given that the procedure is complete, what you're showing is that the system meets that particular specification. 
I think we have uh, four or five minutes left, so I'm just going to move on to uh, neurosymbolic multi-agent systems, which is how we started with. Um, so this is the setup, which is uh, probably the most compelling one, yet it's the most difficult one. So we have a, uh, a number of agents interacting with an environment. Each of them composes a neural layer together with a symbolic layer. So think about a planner together with perception and you will not be very far off from what we're doing here. And, uh, and maybe you also want to check uh, something really AI-based in terms of, the, of these interactions. And here what we check is strategic interplay as defined by logic such as ATL. So, uh, you know, it's very popular formalism in the area of multi-agent systems. So we want to check whether or not a group of agents can bring about a certain state of affairs uh, defined as a temporal uh, is a temporal uh, concept. Okay, so in terms of formalization, again, it becomes a little bit harder, but what you hopefully be able to see from this slide is that it's actually not very far from what um, people have been doing for a number of years in, in the context of uh, interval systems and beyond. We have a set of states, which includes perceptions and some private states. We have some observations, which is a concept that's been used for at least 20 years. So we have an observation function, and the observation function is now a piecewise linear feedforward neural network, which returns values in some space of the real numbers into our representations. We have a set of actions, we have a protocol, we have a transition functions, all things that you know, we are familiar in the space of model checking. Um, now, the specification language now includes uh, ATL modalities, uh, but the negative result here is that even reachability only is undecidable. Okay, so that's a result that also applies to temporal logic, obviously. So we are bounding the length of what we're checking. So there is this limitation where you're always checking a finite, um, a finite length of, um, of, of a path that you're checking. Um, however, in many, many cases, this is still useful. So there is a use case that uh, we're looking at in, in, in the context of avionics, which is uh, a, a system that produces advisories for pilots um, not to have crashes into other pilots. It's a system that already exists, obviously, on airplanes. And so we may want to check that the intruder has a strategy or, or doesn't have a strategy to cause a, a media collusion, a collision after case steps. Okay, irrespective of what everybody else does in the system. These are properties that we can, uh, that we can formulate and we can check. So what are the results here? Well, in terms of complexity, uh, verifying neural symbolic agents against bounded ATL star is P-space hard, and, uh, but it's uh, at least a connex type. Okay, so uh, the upper result, um, effectively comes from QBF validities, reduction, and, uh, and, and the bottom one through existing results on MILP. Now, the way we approach this is through two different MILP encodings, one which is monolithic, and the other is actually to be run in parallel. I will not show you the encodings. This is purely mixed integer linear programming uh, uh, system. Let me tell you instead of how we, um, what we explored by, by the tool that we have. Uh, we have a, an aircraft collision avoidance system, which is called DCAS. That's something that we explored uh, previously. Um, the global states have six variables, the vertical separations between the planes, the own ship vertical climb rate, the intruder vertical climb rate, the time to loss of the vertical separation, which is the safety bus buffer. And then we have neural networks that are producing advisories. Okay, so these neural networks are producing the observations which actually the system then takes action to. Okay, so the agents obtain the advisories and decide what acceleration, what action to perform. Okay, so these neural networks have seven hidden layers with 50 layers roughly each at the end producing an advisory on what to do in the particular situation. The agent has an action, detected, action selection mechanism that will determine what action to perform. And so in this setup, we can verify instances like the ownership has a strategy for the system to remain a safe consideration uh, for up to case steps, 
even by, by starting with an infinite state space, which is defined with some constraints on, on the input region of what you can define. Okay, so uh, here we are, we have a neural symbolic multi-agent system, in this case, only two agents, which have both perception layer and an action selection, which is symbolic. And we are able to verify <clears throat> in this initial case, whether or not ATL specifications hold or do not hold. If you find that the specification does not hold, you will get a counter example with the initial state and all the sequences of actions that will take you uh, to, uh, to a loss of separation. Okay, let me wrap up. Um, so we increasingly seeing, uh, I think, neural symbolic systems and differently from computer science, we actually have very few methods to give guarantees to high systems. So this is obviously highly problematic and safety critical systems, but actually more generally when you have, when you require high reliability. Okay, so what I talked about is verification of perception layer. So it's verifying open, uh, open neural networks and verification of uh, closed systems, such as in neural symbolic. Um, papers and tools are on uh, our web page. Um, challenges. We're not done yet, I don't think. So I think we managed to conquer uh, considerable, considerable numbers of um, uh, um, considerable, you know, big gains in, uh, in scalability. We started with 200, 300 nodes. We can, as I was saying, we can do 300,000 million nodes. Uh, and, and this is progress that's happened only in three, four years. Uh, but it's still more than is needed. So we still need to work more on scalable abstraction and so on. In perception, there has been the tendency to look at uh, noise or very well-defined uh, perturbations. I think more work is required on semantic um, semantic um, specifications where we're actually looking at pose and, and other subtle concepts. Um, there's still a big need of abstraction methods for closed loop neural symbolic systems. Uh, the systems I've been talking about do not scale particularly well to large state spaces. We need to do to, to work more. I think an open question is after you have a verification query that gives a counter example, what do you do with that? So how do you actually repair a model uh, to, to make it work? And of course, there's loads of unknowns, unknowns here, right? We cannot pretend to have all the specification of these systems. So probably we need also to be working on monitoring on the side to be able to uh, monitor the behavior of the neural systems and intervene in case um, they may be misbehaving. Um, there's still much to do. So if you're interested in this area, um, uh, please consider contributing. I think, I think we'll only begin to scratch the surface here. There is so much work that's required in this area. I think it's very important we make progress here. I will stop here. Thank you. That's fantastic, Alessio. I learned a lot from that. It was a really wonderful insight into a body of work which has which has evolved and progressed incredibly quickly. Um, so we have we have time for questions. I certainly have some, so I will come back with mine. Uh, but uh, does anybody else want to go first? If you uh, so, I think we've got a question from Samuel Garcin. Is the first person I see? Yes. Hello. Um... Thank you very much for the uh, presentation, Alessio. That was uh, very, very interesting. Uh, I'm quite new to the domain of neuro uh, symbolic uh, system. And I wanted to ask you, um, what is the uh, advantage of uh, doing the action selection using a symbolic system over a neural only system? Because it seemed that you, you were saying that verification is easier in neural only systems. Um this is a, a this is an absolutely good point. There, there's been lots of approaches where actually action selection is is done neurally, uh, particularly in reinforcement learning and so on. You know that, that's a very successful line. I, I think there has also been a tendency of using legacy systems that are very well understood, particularly in the planning, you know, on the planning side of things. Um, so I you know I think systems in practice tend to be composed of these two very heterogeneous um systems and the challenge is how you actually put them together i think i think from a kind of verification perspective symbolic systems are better understood and um there has been a feeling that vision is really a problem that needs to be solved on the neural side but maybe maybe traditional programming can help uh in in planning action selection and so on 
but but your point is valid. You might as well go fully neural and have a fully neural uh, approach. Indeed, there's autonomous vehicles companies that do precisely this. It would be interesting to see who you know who wins this race. Uh, but in principle, it's entirely possible. The approaches I talked about can tackle both. Okay, thank you very much. And maybe a, a quick follow-up question uh, is, uh, you mentioned that you can verify against uh, some specific uh, um, scenarios, such as noise and luminosity uh, changes. And I was wondering if uh, once you verify against noise and luminosity sample, uh, it, it means that like, if there is an adversarial attack that combines both noise and luminosity, uh, you also verify against that. Yeah, yeah, you can do. You can you can actually put them all together, and 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 um, and actually verify against the union of the possible attacks. Absolutely, you can. But you do have to uh, rerun the verification process uh, for all no, of no, the no, combinations. No, no, you're verifying against several attacks at the same time, and you're very. Of course, the query is going to be harder, so you're not making the job easy for yourself from a computational standpoint. But if you would like to formulate a query in the neighborhood, which is defined as the transformations for noise and the transformation for luminosity combined with some parameters for each, that's a query you can put to the solver. I agree. Thank you very much. Sure. OK, next, I think we've got Fanky Zeng. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thanks for the very informative talk. So I just have a very, very quick question. Have you applied the study in any social systems? or for example, like a financial or economic, uh, economic systems. As we know that uh, in the past two years, they are not on like uh, aging based on modeling work on like a COVID or pandemic scenes. So I was wondering if you have done this kind uh, of work. Funky, thank you for the question. Uh, the, the short answer is no, we haven't done that. It, it will be very interesting to do. And um, that's why I was saying that um, if you're interested, uh, take a look and uh, the tools uh, are, um, publicly available, so um, no, we haven't done that, but it's a good idea. Does anybody else have questions? I certainly have at least one, but if anybody else wants to go first. That's well, like I, I want to ask mine. So Alessio, this is a very high level question, and I'm sure you've thought about it in some sense. Um, but I'm relatively new to, to, to what you're doing here. So when we train a neural network, basically what we're doing is synthesis. We're doing program synthesis, right? I mean, what we're doing is synthesizing. Um, uh, it's uh, synthesizing a function by uh, uh, th through this process of training. And then what we're doing, well, then what you're doing there is verifying that this, 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 this function is satisfies certain properties. Um, could we do... You know, could we look at this through the perspective of the more traditional synthesis perspective, which is, you know, the correct by correctness through the synthesis process and actually move the correctness uh, somehow into the training process and have provably correct training? Um, now, I don't know what that would look like. I mean, I have the faintest idea what that would look like, but has anybody thought about that or any ways of doing that? Uh, the answer is yes, Mike. <laughs> So there are approaches to do, so the, the, the name of the topic is robust learning. So what you're doing while you're learning and you presented those examples, you adding to the loss function also a term that insists of, um, it's a kind of regularizer that insists on smooth level of classification in the present, in the neighborhood of that particular example. So the, the answer to that is yes, you can, and you will obtain, so this is things that we, we worked on, in fact, that we continue to work on. You will obtain neural networks that are a lot more robust by several orders of magnitude with respect to noise, for example. The difficulty or the downside of this is that there is a challenge in terms of accuracy. So you actually get penalized in terms of accuracy, and that is why actually it's not very widely used in practice. So you can get a lot more robustness, but I think the jury is still out as to whether you can get the same accuracy uh, while being robust. So if you could actually get the best of both worlds, so being accurate and be robust at the same time, uh, that, that would be a big prize, I think. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any hands at the moment. 
Okay, then I think we've probably reached the end. Thank you again, Alessia. That was a superb overview of, as I say, a body of work which is which has progressed at an, an incredible rate, and it's really amazing to see uh, to see that how quickly it's progressed and what's going on there. So thank you, everybody. That was the latest in our Turing multi-agent system seminars. Uh, thank you, as always, to Stefano. Uh, Stefano Albrecht in Edinburgh. Stefano, uh, if it's not obvious, is really the driving force behind the Turing uh, multi-agent system special interest group. So thank you, Stefano, for all your work there. Uh, and watch this space. There will be more seminars coming up. So good to see you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alessio.